Okay, then that brings us to Tom Teets and agenda item 32 and 20. We'll have a discussion of water storage options and a proposed resolution on the 20 year Everglades restoration plan. Tom, good morning. Thank good you. Good morning. I was looking for the second presentation. I don't see it, so I'm going to do a little searching. Okay, first I want to start out and talk about uh, some storage options. Welcome, Mr. Harlow, to the board. Glad to have you here. Today I want to talk a little bit about, in the storage options overview, I want to talk about some of our challenge that we face, uh, the storage and treatment types of facilities that we have currently being implemented and some of them that we have in the pipeline to be implemented and then uh, future storage and treatment options and opportunities. And I'd also like to touch on the U.S. Sugar option as well. For those of you that have been around a long time, you'll recognize this, those that are new. Um, this, these are some graphics and uh, that we've used uh, throughout the development of uh, Everglades restoration really f over the last uh, 15 years or so. So I just want to kind of describe a couple of things here that I think kind of frames up what we're talking about today on uh, really the system challenges. Um, up at the top you see this uh, uh, four square called QQTD and uh, it's quality, quantity, timing, distribution. And what we found as we've gone through this Everglades restoration process that these are really four key attributes that we've got to keep in mind wherever we go and wherever we do our planning QQD always comes into play. So it's, it's kind of, it's a context that the team has used and, and, and we find ourselves constantly going back to keeping these four things in mind as we do our uh, planning and implementation for uh, restoration of the Everglades. Uh, the, the graphics that you see are, are, are graphics that we've been use, using historically. They're very stylized. Don't take a, a, a position of an arrow literally. Um, but it, it just gives indications of just um, how the system was uh, pre-drainage and how the water flowed. As you see, it, it flowed down through the Kissimmee Valley into Everglades, uh, into uh, Lake Okeechobee and then spilled over the edge of Lake Okeechobee um, and then on into the Everglades. Um, and you know, with a lesser amount of water, obviously no water going to St. Lucie and really a lesser amount going out the Clusehatchee. There was some out the Clusehatchee, but not as much. So that was really the pre-drainage condition. It kind of gives us a context of of where we are and, and, and kind of the ultimate, it won't be really the where we can get ultimately because this will never be able to get this system back. Uh, we've lost about half of it, so we have to do, work with what we have. Um, the center is um, a stylized uh, picture again of the the managed flows that we have today after, after we've um, compartmentalized the system, uh, added the CNSF project and, and, and what we look at and what we see um, throughout the system. And some of the key things you see there is <clears throat> water coming down the Kissimmee River is not coming down, hasn't been coming down the Kissimmee River, it's, now it's coming down C-38 very quickly to, to the lake. Um, so you have a real, fat, real fast movement of water into Lake Okeechobee. Uh, the lake itself, we didn't uh, modify it in this graphic, but the lake itself is really only about half the size as it was. It's now diked. Uh, when water needs to come out of Lake Okeechobee, uh, it no longer spills over the south, south edge. Some of it can go south, and you heard that, talking about that today, about how we're striving to really move more water south. So we're, we're kind of inching our way towards this, with the last graphic really, um, on the side there. But what we still face are when the lake gets high, we have the high discharges to the Clusehatchee and the high discharges to, to the St. Lucie. We also have significant local basin runoff. Um, and, and that's something that we um, have to keep in mind as well as we start to look for solutions uh, for restoration. On down through the system, um, the uh, water conservation areas are now compartmentalized. Um, the water flows you know, through the canals through the system, not much sheet flow through that system, and that's something that we re really need to regain uh, so the Everglades uh, can regain its classic characteristic as a river of grass. Our ridges and sloughs are filling in. At the top end, it's too dry. At the bottom end, it's too wet uh, when the water conservation areas. Um, the water for Everglades National Park is predominantly going into the west side of Everglades National Park, as you see. 
and we need to shift that flow so more of it's going over um, into the east side of the park. So you look over on the, on the uh, far side then is the restored flows, and that's you know, generally where we're trying to head. Uh, you see up there at the top with Kissimmee River uh, restoration, we still have the flows coming down the Kissimmee, but they're going to be of better timing um, that we're going to be able to uh, have additional storage in that area, which also will um, provide benefits as well as reduce the phosphorus in the Lake Okeechobee, and the timing will be much better. Our goal is obviously to reduce those estuary uh, discharges, um, both to the St. Lucie and Clusehatchee River. We'll never get all the way there probably, but we, re we want to significantly reduce those discharges as much as possible uh, um, to those two estuaries. We want to move more water south um, through our storage treatment areas uh, in, in the uh, EAA and uh, move it on down into Everglades National Park. We envision additional storage north of Lake Okeechobee as well, and I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that as well. So that kind of just gives you a, kind of a feel for what the challenges are and where we really head, are heading with restoration here in the future. I want to just touch on the fact that we're just not planning anymore, we're actually implementing, and that's, that's really important. Uh, we're making really good progress. We've, you know, restoration strategies is, and which will uh, ultimately improve the um, operations of our existing stormwater treatment areas is uh, moving along very nicely. Um, you have two pictures there, the um, uh, L8 flow equalization basin, that's one that uh, the RAC visited this last week, and the A1 FEB, uh, which is just north of SDA 3.4. Between these two facilities, uh, we're adding close to 100,000 acre feet of storage to the system. The C44 Reservoir NSTA is now being built. The inflow pumps, to, uh, inflow uh, um, structures are, are, are built. This is the beginning of our work associated with the STA out there. Um, we've awarded $140 million of contracts for this. So um, the district is, and the state is moving along very nicely to, to really get that project going and get it in the ground as, as quickly as we can. Uh, this this re Reservoir NSTA is going to provide 60,000 acre feet of storage, capture that local basin runoff in the St. Lucie, and um, reduce reduce um, the uh, um, nutrients to the, to the estuary to the tune of 26 um, metric tons. Uh, the Lakeside Ranch STA, and this one I'll be pointed out on the map in a second. This is uh, um, one of our initial STAs uh, for the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Project, and it's and it's one that's uh, highlighted in the Lake Okeechobee. Um, BMAP, uh, Basin Management Action Plan. Uh, this is our, one of our first STAs on the north side of the lake. It's on different kind of land. It's a new experience for us. It's on very sandy soils. And uh, we're looking at it and, and having very good success in the operations of it. It's just started this last year. Uh, the ultimate goal here is to uh, be able to remove about 19 metric tons of, of phosphorus coming out of the Taylor Creek Numbin Slough Basin in the, into uh, Lake Okeechobee. And then finally, we have Kissimmee River restoration. Uh, you heard a lot about the, the restoration activities. Uh, good progress is being made. We broke some log jams on that restoration effort this last year. The Corps is out there uh, starting to do additional backfills now um, on the remaining portions of it. We own all the land that, we, that, that is needed to get that uh, construction done. Working hard to finish up the land acquisition at the north end for the headwaters revitalization. Ultimately, we'll be able to store um, upwards of 130 thousand acre feet of water in this basin. So we're making good progress and, 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 we're, and we're working really hard to, to move ahead. Future projects that we have in the pipeline now. Um, C43 Reservoir was, al was already uh, noted by Mr. Hutchcraft. That's, that's a um, facility that um, we're, we're, we've received uh, state um, funding for uh, in the previous year. We're hoping we get additional state funding in the future so we can uh, move ahead and, and uh, get that reservoir uh, on the, on the, well on its way and, and being built. Ultimately, that's going to hold 170,000 acre feet of water, a combination of both local basin runoff and runoff uh, and discharges from Lake Okeechobee. The additional IRL South projects, the, the C25 and the C2324 reservoir and STAs, uh, those projects are, are um, been, been authorized. We have the agreement with the Corps to be able to move forward those, on those in the future. Those ultimately will add another 100,000 acre feet of storage to the basin and remove another 33 metric tons of phosphorus flowing to the estuaries, primarily local basin runoff. 
We're looking to uh, build Lakeside Phase 2. That's a project that's been identified in the uh, Lake Okeechobee BMAP that needs to move ahead as soon as possible, as soon as we have funding for that. And then as we move on down, we have the other restoration strategies features. Again, these features are being built to enhance the performance of our existing STAs, which we have a tune of about 57,000 acres of those. STA 1 West is about a 6,500-acre area. That's going to be an expansion uh, to improve the phosphorus. That will go in, uh, coincide with L8 FEB. Moving over to the west side, um, we'll be working on a um, flow equalization basin in the C-139 basin to enhance the performance of uh, STA-5. And we'll also be doing some uh, work within STA-5 to uh, expand its treatment area by about uh, 800 acres. So uh, those, are, uh, those are restoration strategy projects that are down the road a little bit, but they'll be coming along. We're well on our way with the design for uh, STA-1 West expansion phase one. Uh, which is the area that we uh, did the uh, swap uh, for, so we had the land for it and we do the design for it. Um, the Central Everglades planning project, that's what we call them set features. Uh, those now, that, that project, the planning's been completed. It's waiting authorization from Congress. Um, we know what the projects are that need to come out of it. Um, we have the A2 flow equalization basin, which will ultimately um, capture and store another 60,000 acre feet of storage. Uh, we have the other features, um, the north features and the south features, both sets of those features will ultimately begin to open up the system and decompartmentalize the conservation areas so we can actually recreate the flow through the Everglades and they enable that flow through the Everglades and start to restore that ridge and sluice system that we need so badly. Also, it will enable us to pass more water into Everglades National Park. So ultimately, um, you know, we're looking at, at uh, Central Everglades to be able to um, move at least about another 215,000 acre feet of water on average uh, into uh, the water conservation areas. And finally, water, uh, water, uh, Broward County Water Preserve Areas is an important project in Broward County. Um, the small impoundments that will reduce the uh, pumpage from S9 into the conservation areas and also the 3A3B seepage management area which will reduce the seepage out of the area. Uh, out of the water conservation areas. So these are projects that are on the books, they're in the pipeline, and we're getting ready to move, move ahead in, in those in the future. Now the job's not done, there's still more to do. Um, obviously there's still a need for additional regional scale storage and treatment uh, in the future. So I just wanted to just touch on these real quick, I'm not going to get into detail, but these, you know, these are the types of features that, you know, anything you read from us and, and the kinds of facilities that we think that will ultimately be needed to continue to make the progress uh, to fulfill those restoration goals. You have the deep reservoirs, you know, 12 feet deep, 15 feet deep. Shallow reservoirs, usually about four feet deep. We have the aquifer surge recovery. Uh, that's basically a, a well that uh, we capture water when we have high flows. We pump it down into the Florida aquifer. Uh, store it and then bring it back when there's a need um, to either attenuate uh, low levels in Lake, Lake, Lake Okeechobee or if there's a water supply need downstream. We have dispersed water management, which is the, the shallow um, uh, storage on, on, on farm or even on district properties um, that's out there. O obviously, operational changes are going to be key. As these large facilities come online, we're going to have to go back and look at how do we change the operations of the overall system as well as Lake Okeechobee. Are there opportunities uh, to change the operations slightly to both improve our storage capability and also in, enhance the, the ecological uh, state of the system? Storm our treatment areas that we already have, uh, we'll need more of those. Need the, need, we'll need more of those uh, throughout the system, both north and south, as we push more water uh, through the system. And, there, and the concept of deep well injection is out there as well. That's an idea of capturing water there is excess water and instead of putting it down just to be stored in the upper Florida and this would be basically pumped down into the uh, boulder zone which is about 3,000 feet deep and disposed of so it's 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 gone you don't get it back uh, that's that's one uh, approach that could be used something we looked at in some of our um, Lake Okeechobee planning uh, in the past is there are some really localized areas north of the lake that are really high in phosphorus that just are very irregular in their flow so building an STA may not be cost effective and maybe some place to look at a deep well. So we could turn on a deep well periodically certain times of the year and just um, basically dispose of that high phosphorus water. So those are the, many of the concepts that are out there. 
next slide just kind of gives you a feel of just from low to high, just you know, what kind of storage you get on a per acre basis uh, for these different uh, facilities. You see that dispersed water management, very, you know, it's a very low tech, you know, doesn't store a huge amount of water, huge amount of water on a per acre basis. Then you have STAs, which really their purpose is not just for storage, it's also for treatment. Then you have shallow storage, deep storage, and ASR. ASR doesn't have much of a footprint, so it, it can store a lot of water per acre. Per acre. Um, then looking down at the phosphorus reduction, deep storage obviously isn't the goal. Of that isn't for phosphorus reduction; is mainly for storage. You may get a small amount of uh, reductions. Shallow storage many times does provide us some some storage, uh, some uh, phosphorus reduction capabilities. Um, the flow equalization basins and shallow storage are, are very similar. Uh, then dispersed uh, storage. The ASR, actually, um, the ASR test results from the pilot program have indicated um, really excellent phosphorus reduction. Sometimes we see 80% phosphorus reduction, and, and actually the, the pilot North Lake Okeechobee has shown that, which is very promising because that's where we really want to reduce phosphorus. Obviously, STA is very important for phosphorus reduction, and obviously if you have a deep well, if you inject it and don't bring it back, it's gone, so it's very fairly uh, efficient. So that's going to give you a feel for just the performance of the different types of treatment. I'll just talk a little bit about where the different kinds of storage and treatment are needed in the, in the future as we progress on the, on the path towards restoration. First of all, really a combination of storage and treatment north and south of the lake is, is really going to be needed to meet our goals. They give different benefits, and that's what I want to just talk a little bit about and, and, and walk you through. Uh, the northern storage, and that's basically when I talk about northern storage, is just storage north of Lake Okeechobee. Um, the benefits that it derives is it attenuates both the high and low Lake Okeechobee levels. Um, the treatment obviously can improve the water flowing into Lake Okeechobee. Ultimately, as the lake improves and the lake quality improves, um, it'll also be beneficial to the estuaries and the Everglades. I hope over time is we make progress on the Basin Management Action Plan for Lake Okeechobee. The quality going into Lake Okeechobee is better. It's going to take some time, but then Lake Okeechobee will slowly become um, less eutrophic, and it will have better quality, and the water flowing out of Lake Okeechobee will ultimately become better. Um, also, um, northern storage, you can improve the, improve the timing of flow both into the lake, uh, into the estuaries because you're attenuating the high and low lake levels, and obviously into the Everglades because you have more control at the, there at the north end. The south storage and treatment um, benefits. South storage, when we have very high lake levels, um, like we've had in the past, we can move water off the lake and store it uh, to the south, and so that attenuates the high uh, lake of trivia levels. That, that obviously is going to, um, we also, um, when we put the treatment south of the lake, that's going to improve the quality of water flowing into the glades. So if we, as we build additional storage south, um, we'll need to build uh, additional treatment to the south. Also, it improves the timing of the flow, flow of water going to the estuaries. Obviously, if we can uh, reduce the highs uh, in Lake Okeechobee, that's going to improve uh, the flows to the estuaries, and it also improves the flows of the glades. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. Shirter option. The map you have in front of you is basically shows the entire area of the um, U.S. sugar lands that were considered for acquisition. Uh, the 2010 acquisition um, of the uh, uh, 26,000 or, or over 26,000 acres, that's shown in green. And that's the area that's here, Southern Gardens and the L.A. parcel. Southern Gardens is being used, utilized, a, a large part of it is going to be restored into a mixed marsh system, and the northern portion of it will ultimately be the um, uh, flow equalization basin for the C-130, uh, for the uh, STA-5. The LA parcel was used um, in land swaps in order for us to uh, uh, get the land we needed to ex do the phase one of the land um, of, of the expansion of STA-1 West. The dark brown area is the initial non-exclusive option lands, which are 46,800 uh, 46, acres. And then the area that's in light tan is the uh, entire option lands, um, <clears throat> which, which are on the order of uh, 
153,000 acres. So that just kind of spatially gives you a feel for where the different uh, pieces of property are and in, in, in what, what, what is what part of which option. Now the district uh, acquisition of the uh, 26,000, about 800 uh, acres, uh, $497 million, uh, that, that was uh, completed in August of 2010. The non-exclusive initial option, again, those are the dark brown uh, lands that I showed on the map. Uh, those, that acreage is to be acquired uh, at fair market value, and that um, option expires on, in uh, October 2015. Then the next option is a non-exclusive entire option. This is for the entire 153,000 acres, um, again, to be acquired at fair market value, um, and it expires uh, in 2020. Along with these options, there's also, these options are subject to uh, leaseback provisions. These initial, uh, these uh, option lands are subject to a 20-year leaseback to U.S. Sugar. Uh, the district can terminate 10,000 acres of cane land in the first 10 years, in the first 10-year term, and then an additional 10,000 acres of cane land in the second 10-year term. Uh, to date, we've terminated 8,900 acres, um, uh, and that was as a result of the STA-1 West land exchange. Uh, therefore, um, of the first uh, 10,000 acres in the first 10 years, uh, we have uh, 1,100 acres uh, remaining. So basically, uh, we can terminate about 11,000, if we uh, would own the property, um, we could terminate uh, 11,000 acres in the next 20 years. And just for... Uh, um, the sake of information, uh, there at the bottom, you see a link on our website that, to all the purchase documents associated with the U.S. Sugar acquisition. So that kind of gives you a very high level um, feel for what the uh, U.S. Sugar option is and, and the leaseback provisions. So in summary, uh, the current system obviously has many challenges. Um, we do have many projects underway, and we're making very good progress, and ultimately there the, we will need a combination of storage and treatment both north and south of Lake of Chobe um, for meeting our ultimate restoration goals. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Tom. And what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to hold the board questions until we go through the, your presentation on agenda item 20, and then we'll, I think they all relate, and then we'll have the board discussion on those items and the public comment on those items together. Um, so if you want to run, run through your, your next related presentation, then we'll, I'm sure we've got plenty of questions and comments for you. Okay. Okay, now this is regarding um, the Governor Scott's 20-year funding request um, for Everglades restoration. What the governor has proposed is a 20-year commitment to Everglades restoration funding. Uh, the implementation, implementation of the governor's plan is really going to be critical to deliver the benefits to the Everglades ecosystem, and really it's talking and it relates to those projects that I described that are in the pipeline, uh, that are happening, that are ready to happen, and really relates to those projects that are that will be implemented in the future as well. Ultimately. Um, the goal here is uh, capture and store about a million acre feet of, 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 water, of fresh water for storage. And that's 330 billion gallons of water, um, which will obviously significantly um, decrease the frequency and intensity of the harmful discharges that we have to the, to the estuaries. And it also will provide additional flows south uh, into the Everglades. The, as far as phosphorus reduction, um, with all the facilities that, are, that um, uh, could be implemented, uh, we could re reduce the amount of phosphorus loads to Lake Okeechobee, the Clusehatchee, the St. Lucie, and the Everglades by uh, a little over 250 metric tons per year. I think everybody received a, uh, a little brochure on this. this. 
And this brochure has a couple of charts in it that are kind of helpful to kind of give you a feel for just what kind of storage capacity and benefits that would be expected um, from the governor's proposed plan here. Um, as you see, this is the estimated annual water storage capacity by region. This is kind of old, give you, give you uh, five-year slices. Uh, there's boxes that have uh, project names that are above the chart. Uh, those are many of those um, projects uh, that are highlighted there are, are projects that I discussed in my uh, previous presentation. Uh, the benefits and, and the storage capacities. Um, are broken into four categories. Um, the restoration strategies is uh, the blue. North and southern, northern and southern Everglades storage is broken, um, is shown in purple. Uh, the Clusehatchee estuary storage is shown in, in tan or yellowish. And the St. Lucie estuary storage is shown in green. And across the bottom there are, are some bars, and it gives you a feel for what kind of expected benefits that would be seen uh, over time, um, obviously red is, is where we just aren't there yet and we're, we're still, uh, really haven't um, regained uh, any kind of, equal, you know, we haven't gotten where we need to. Um, as we get to the yellowish and green where there's still ecological degradation but our trajectory is the right trajectory and starting to prove things. And we get to green, uh, it's, it's sustainable. And the lighter green is still not quite fully restored, and dark green is pretty much we feel it's a restored hydrology. So you can see just how it progresses over time uh, as the levels of storage are increased uh, in the future. The next chart shows the estimated annual phosphorus removal. Um, by region. As I noted at the beginning, um, ultimately um, looking at a reduction of about 250 uh, metric tons of, of uh, phosphorus uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, we see in the next uh, four years uh, a reduction in phosphorus loading by eight, 80 metric tons. Again, uh, some, of the pro uh, some of the projects that I uh, talked about previously are in the boxes uh, along the chart. And the chart is color coded uh, based upon um, the region that where the um, phosphorus uh, reduction is occurring. The proposed plan provides benefits throughout the South Florida ecosystem. Uh, a number of these projects are now underway, and, and I really talked about uh, previously. Um, and, and, and really, and many, many of them have a significant planning that have already been completed. There will be additional projects that will be planned and implemented over the next 20 years that, that aren't well defined here yet, but those will be uh, developed and implemented uh, over time. You know, along with the increased storage and water quality treatment that these provide, uh, this is going to increase uh, more natural flows. Uh, it's going to increase the water supply for all users. And it's also going to reduce the impacts of sea level rise as we cre create more flow through, through the system and, going, and more flow into Florida Bay. As you can see, the, the, the projects are scattered throughout the system, so those benefits are, are, are really derived throughout the system. The, the, the blues are the restoration strategies, and again, and the, and the purples are northern and southern uh, Everglades. Clusehatchee is um, in yellow, and the St. Lucie is in green. That completes my presentation, and be happy to take questions. Thank you, Tom. Okay, board questions for Tom regarding the two presentations. Mr. Powers? I'll go first. Um, first presentation, SERP, uh, SERP projects. Can you, um, how many SERP projects have been completed? None. Well, actually, the one small project has been completed. It's the Maluka Eradication Facility. That's it. And then can you help me understand I've, um, a lot of what's been represented out there suggests that our drinking water, our water supply is at risk. Um, but yet, looking at how we go about water supply, we work on very long planning horizons and updated on a very regular basis. Can, can you, is there a thread there? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't get it. I've gone through everything that I know and understand, 
and water supply is a key component of this agency, and I've not seen or understood anything that suggests that the, uh, the, the abundance and the quality of drinking water in Florida is at risk. I think, well, I think we're in good shape uh, drinking water-wise. Um, if we could hold the comments from the, from the audience, we're going to have the discussion. Everybody's going to have an opportunity to speak. We're not going to have outbursts. We're going to have you removed. Thank you. I mean, we, we work on more than, what, a 20-year planning horizon. Right, right. In fact, uh, the, the, each of our water supply plans is updated. It looks 20 years out. Right. And then even during the development of the, of the resiting of the SERP, mm -hmm. we, were, we factored in additional population and water supply needs. And the concept there was is that basically increasing the amount of water availability within the system for beneficial uses, whether it be environmental, water supply, you know, whatever. So what we see is that over time, and, and just kind of alludes to the fact of as we push more water through the system, so we push more, more, wa more water um, through the, the, the conservation areas in Everglades National Park, there will be a side benefit to, as, as the population increases, there will be more water supply available for the increase in population. I got gotcha. you. I've got more, but I'll, uh, I'll hold on. I'll okay, thank you. Mr. Moran? Thank you, Tom. Following up to Mr. Power's question uh, and uh, in your review of the uh, of the option, uh, uh, is, is there any direct relation if we acquired that uh, option property uh, to uh, to quality of the drinking water or its supply for South Florida? The is the, are you talking about if you would put. A, Put a facility at that lo uh, location within that option lands, right? Not really, because you know there's other options. Of, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get there, mm -hmm. and that that's only one one uh, option that's available as far as different types of storage. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hutchcraft. The, your your discussion about the uh, the option and the the ten year takedown or the ten thousand acre takedown per mm -hmm. ten years, do those limitations apply also if you're doing the swap of the land? So any swap would have to take those conditions into account as well. Yes, I believe uh, so. Is that right? Uh, my understanding is also there's provisions in the uh, the option that requires a two-year notice before you can have the farming terminated. In order to do that, my recollection, and Kirk, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is you've got to have a, a, a project and a funded project and give them the notice. And so there's a, a, a lot of upfront design work. You have to know the boundaries of the land, do the design, get it identified, funded, and then give them a two-year notice. Uh, and, and so we're, we're talking about a significant delay in any project being implemented. Is that a fair statement? That's a very good summary of the contract language. Yeah. I, I think there's also provisions in the contract regarding uh, the, the, uh, the district and or the state's obligation to re replace, remove, relocate certain uh, infrastructure components. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there's two or three railroads and spurs. There's a county road. There's FP&L easement. There's internal irrigation structures. All of those would have to be relocated such that it wouldn't adversely impact the surrounding uses. And is there a cost associated with that? Oh, definitely, yeah. Maybe that's a John question. Can I sneak in and ask you, can I look at the map? Yeah. Sorry, Mitch. Yep. John, do we have a, a handle on what those additional infrastructure replacement or relocation costs would be? Yes, sir. I mean, if we go back and we look at some of the work that was done under the phase one planning effort for the River of Grass back in 2010, um, there were a number of stakeholder teams that, that conceptualized various projects on these lands. Um, part of that was looking exactly at what Mr. Hutchcraft is talking about, the relocations of the existing infrastructure being the power lines, the county road, the railroad, drainage facilities, um, and there is additional costs that would be associated with relocating those that infrastructure. Uh, when you talk about uh, some of the high transmission lines that crisscross the sites, um, you could be looking at a million dollars a mile to be able to relocate that transmission line. So there are additional infrastructure relocation costs associated with it. But we don't have a dollar amount on what the total cost would be to it would, take it all down. It's, and it's project specific. 
and how it lays out. Um, for the one particular conceptualization that was done during that phase one planning effort, you could be looking at um, $50 million for some of those relocations under that concept. Also, some of the conversation that I've heard is, you know, buy the land and send the water south, let's reestablish this flowway. Is, is the opportunity to create a, you know, a, a gravity flowway that would connect Lake Okeechobee to the Everglades, uh, is, is that technologically feasible? Is it realistic? And, and my, my question is kind of backed up by the UF study. Right. We've heard a lot of conversation about what the UF study says, and, and I think so far that's been pretty selective. Uh, but on page 9, it says an independent assessment suggests that an expansive gravity-driven wet flowway throughout the Everglades may not be feasible or provide maximal benefits. And so, you know, I think that the perception that the public might get, let's just buy the land and create this flowway, um, it, it, it's got significant challenges, and that's clearly identified in the U.S. study. I, I assume, I, I know, but I assume that the district has reviewed the U.S. study in great detail after it came out. Right, and, and a lot of the information that was derived from previous recent, you know, um, work that the, the Corps and other people have done. And one of the you know, problems that the challenges that we have within the, the Everglades Ag area is that you know, it's subsided. Um, so in anything you do in that area is going to end up being a pump-type system. And what, as we've looked more and more at it, we found that really the, the ideal combination is really what's happening with restoration strategies right now, where you have storage associated with the treatment system. And that's, you know, obviously that's a, a pump type system with a lot of controls. And, and in reading the, the U.S. study, uh, you know, I, we, we talked a fair amount the last couple of meetings about constraints, and there was some, uh, some credulity associated with our, our discussion about constraints. But as I read the U.S. study, it, it went into great de detail identifying the the legal constraints, the environmental constraints, the physical constraints, and, and it concluded that there are significant barriers to implementing a number of these plans. And one of the recommendations that it made, it made five recommendations. The first recommendation was finish the projects that are on board. And I think that's kind of consistent with the projects that you listed and identified because they provide you know, restoration strategies, provide water quality, SEP provides additional storage and the opportunity to move water south, C44 and C43 address those local basin runoff and discharge. And, and I'm, I'm concerned that, that those aspects of the UF study haven't been publicly discussed because it, it's certainly in there. Um, and, and I think that's important to, to identify. And, and boy, I, I tell you, one of the things that I was uh, most interested in, in getting on the board about was to make sure that we started implementing projects to make sure that we got projects moving, funded, accelerated so that we could see the results, the benefit of that. And I appreciate the hard work that staff's done to tee these projects up. Uh, there's a huge list of projects that have been accomplished, accelerated, advanced in the last two to five years, and, and I think that the district ought to be proud of them. Uh, and uh, I'll hold the rest of my comments, but I, I've got a number of, but I do appreciate it. And, and the critical component is we have to have a dedicated funding source to make sure that we keep moving these projects forward. And without that, uh, things will move much slower. Do we all wish it would go faster? Yes. In order to do that, we need a dedicated funding source. Thank, thanks, Mitch. I have, I have two questions for you, Tom. Uh, for the 46,800 acres, what do we expect? I know it's based upon a, a fair market value that's determined by appraisal. And at first I thought getting an appraisal would be simple. You just get an appraisal of what land is worth in the EAA and you multiply it times 46.8 thousand. And uh, I understand it's a lot more uh, complicated than that. But what do we, what do we think the, the, the expected ballpark range of the purchase of the 46,800 acres would be? It's been a lot of numbers talked about probably in the range of uh, five to 700 million. And is that based upon what we're seeing in the latest um, sales or transfer yeah, of the property in that area? Yeah, some of the more recent appraisals out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I also uh, I wanted to touch base about if the property has, let's say that, there, that a significant portion of the property had significant muck on it. Let's say, well, one, 
what kind of muck are we dealing with, and can we store it with the muck on there, or do we need to remove the muck as part of a storage option? Six to eight feet of muck, I believe, right, on this piece of property, because it's really up close to the lake on the, on the uh, largest piece there. Um, and basically, in order to build a project, and John, you jump here, I can get off track here. Uh, to build a project, um, you have to basically, in the area, the footprint of the levee, you're going to have to scrape out the muck and, and get down to the bedrock because that's really one of the problems that they ran into with the Herbert Hoover Dyke. So they build a levee on top of muck. You can't do that. So you need to get scrape the muck out. So all the footprint of the levee all the way around it would be scraped out, have to be scraped, and that's where you build your foot, you know, footprint of your levee. I believe you can leave the, the muck in the middle. Yes, in, in any deep reservoir, deep storage facility, you have to do what we call foundation preparation for the dam and make sure the dam is resting on a solid surface. And Tom is exactly correct. You would have to scrape that area around wherever the embankment goes, either the perimeter embankment or if there's any internal embankments associated with the project. Um, primarily for the interior portions of the storage feature, um, you can, that muck is okay to remain. Um, for, as with any uh, former land practices or land use, or maybe some soil remediation that would have to take place in those interior portions of the facility. But um, it's mainly the, around the exterior that you would have to remove that muck. Okay. And then let me understand this, this lease back and the limitation on, on, they call it termination of 10,000 acres. So I guess if we were to buy the land, we have to lease all of it back to the, to the owner, and then we have an ability to terminate that lease as to only 10,000 acres per 10 years. 10,000 acres per year. Yeah, and does that start years. from the mm -hmm. 2010 takedown where we, we acquired the? I believe so, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've already we've taken down about 8,900 acres in the first five years. Since right, the, because of the um, L8 um, swap. Okay, so really we can only uh, use an, an additional 1,100 acres over the next five years or terminate that from the from the lease back, Kirk? But the, you have 1,000 acres still left from the first 10,000 acres, and then starting in 2020, then you can take down the remaining 10,000 acres. So that gives you the 11,000 acres that's still available in terms of our takedown on Okay, so 1,000 acres between now and 2020, right, we've already, and then another 10,000 acres after that, and then another 10,000 acres after that 10-year period. It's going to be, we've already, you know, we, when we bought the property up there by the, the L.A. parcel, that was about 9,000 acres, and then we used that in a swap. So that was 9,000 of our first 10,000 acres, so we have 1,000 acres left there. When we get to the start of the section, second 10-year you know, period, then we have another 10,000 acres, so, and that would be in 2020. So as of 2020, there would be a potential to acquire 11,000 acres of cane land from U.S. Sugar. Okay. Or, or take it. We've already acquired it. It would be to take it off of the lease. Another 10,000 point Correct. No, no. Well, there's 20,000. The, the first 10,000 started when we – when we acquired the property, when we acquired the 9,000 acres up there on the L.A. So that's part of the first 10,000 takedown starting in 2010. Right. Okay, and then in 2020, we can go ahead and get an additional 10,000 takedown. Okay. So that's the total 11,000, which would be, be completed potentially by 2030, but it would do the second takedown starting 2020. Sorry if this is getting a little... No, it's a complicated transaction, and I, I want to make sure that we understand it and that everybody understands it. It's not <clears> – <throat> I don't think it's a um, simple solution. It's not like we, we – if we were to decide that that we were going to acquire it and we had the, the 500 or $700 million to do it, that immediately we could go in there and just store the, the water on there. We've got these – the lease back, we've got – we right. take it down in, in tranches, and then we have to go come up with a – project design that, that coincides with the amount of acreage that we have access to that's not leased back for continual farming for decades to come. Yeah, correct. We have 1,000 left that we could use for a project terminating on 2020, and then we would have another 10,000 acres at that point. So you, any large project would have to wait until after 2020. Okay. Well, and I think that those those um, explanations and those details are important to the 
to the full analysis. I mean, it's a, it's obviously a very complex transaction, and then when you layer on it the potential projects and what we can do on that property and how we can do that in, in pieces, it's it's not a simple solution to a very complex problem that we have. Correct. Other, other board comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Hatchcock? At, at work and at home, I have to deal with, you know, the timing of money, you know, what comes in, what goes out. And so I think there's a principle of opportunity cost. And so if you look at this project and, and the potential $500 million, $700 million acquisition cost, and then there's additional costs with relocating infrastructure, additional costs associated with moving muck, and the realization that you probably couldn't bring that online for pick a number, 20 plus years, you're spending money now for something you can't use in the future and you're consuming those resources that could be allocated to other projects that would create a, a, a meaningful impact. And so uh, I, I, I'm concerned and want to know if, if you're concerned. I mean, we, we've seen how difficult it is to get dedicated, reliable funding for our projects. And if we spend those resources today on something we can't use for 20 years, do we lose other opportunities to advance projects? Well, it could take, potentially take away from some of the projects we talk about that are in the pipeline now or sure. ready to be constructed, yes. Thank you. Mr. Moran. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, it's a very complicated issue. I, I remember when, when uh, we acquired that the, the first uh, U.S. Sugar Land back in 2010, there was an issue on uh, what some of that, how some of that land could be used because there were – cultural remains on, on some of the property that precluded or restricted uh, being able to store water on it. it. Could that be an issue with, with these parcels as well? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I don't think the uh, cultural resource surveys have been done in this particular area yet. So that's, that's, that would be an open question. So, so un, until that were ascertained, we wouldn't even know whether, if we did acquire the property, whether we could store water on it or not. Right. You have to do that analysis yeah, to see. Thank you. Any further board questions or comments for Tom? Mr. Barber? Tom, in, in reviewing the UF study, I noticed that uh, some of the storage that's been approved wasn't counted in their analysis, like the Alico dispersed water storage or Nicodemus Slough that added up to near 125,000 acre feet. Did you notice that? You know, I did. I, I noticed that there were that there was some numbers left out, and, and, and you know, they could, you know, could have been that they. I don't know why they did left it out. Yep. It's not there. Yeah. yeah, they may have gotten that information late to get into their study. Yeah. Um, and this might be a question for uh, Mr. Hutchcraft, but in the the DAX BMP slate, is there retention detention as as part of their BMPs? Nor um, north of Lake Okeechobee, they have a whole array of different kinds of BMPs that they're looking at. And I think probably detention is, is plays a part of there, yes. And, and what North of Lake, what happens in many cases, too, is that the landowners are looking for opportunities to enroll in uh, USDA programs, NRCS programs like uh, EQUIP, to, to, for opportunities for them to really kind of hold the water on the land, do some ditch plugging and things like that. So it's kind of a, a little bit lower tech dispersed water management in some cases right. that holds that water back. And, and that's really effective in keeping the phosphorus from flowing in uh, to the downstream areas. So there could be some opportunities there. But do you have any reaction to that, Mr. Hutchcraft? No, I, I agree with him. I think that the, the BMPs have a, a, a menu, a list of options, and, and one of the main focuses is on control of, uh, of stormwater and runoff. And so the opportunity is to hold it longer, store it, detain it, treat it, uh, and those are certainly options contained within the BMP uh, guidelines. Okay, thank you. Um, let me look through my list here. So many of you covered the things that I was going to talk about. The, the, the governor's uh, slate over 20 years, how, how can that happen? Is it, 
is it something we re ask the legislature to continue to do each year? I'm not sure who I'm asking this, but Blake. The governor in his proposed budget this year uh, proposed a recurring source of funding for Everglades restoration. Um, and uh, that has uh, started moving through the legislature uh, and the, the governor is uh, making a final push to try to memorialize in legislation a recurring source of funding to get all these projects done. Uh, not only the named projects, but the projects to be named. And so uh, it's a historic precedent. We've never had that before. Uh, I think we all realize that the progress that we've made over the last 18 months uh, have been largely associated with the availability of these funds and the dedication of funds for getting projects done. Every year we go to the legislature and we fight for our money uh, to, 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 to do Everglades projects. This would memorialize, this would uh, establish a dedicated source of funding for Everglades restoration. And so uh, that's, that's what's being proposed, is a, is a recurring dedicated source of funding for Everglades restoration. Thank you. Thanks, Blake. And, 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 I, and, I, and I know when, when you talk about that, um, that is something that they would establish legislation so you wouldn't have to go back every year and have that same ask. It would be a certain percentage of the dock stamp revenue that's allocated at a minimum funding level for Everglades restoration that would total $5 billion over 20 years. And, and, and that is significant, particularly when you look at, at South Florida Water Management District and our budgetary constraints and what we can do, what we can afford to do. I think our ad valorem taxes, Doug, what, they run somewhere in the $260 million range, give or take, and, um, and our budget's in excess of $750 million. And so we have, outside of our, our taxing authority, we have money that's coming from a, a number of sources, but a significant portion of that is money that we rely on the state to, to fund for these projects. And we've been very successful in getting significant funding to, to finish a lot of projects. But we, we might not always be successful, and we don't want to have to go every year to say, hey, well, let's remember that this is a big funding priority. So I, I think that the, the governor's budget uh, and, and our proposed resolution in favor of this legislation, which would establish a, a, a identified funding source, is hugely significant. We will look back and say that was a game changer in terms of Everglades restoration. And um, I think it's, it's easy to kind of lose perspective of that when you talk about potentially $5 billion and then another potential $5 billion of of federal matching money, I mean, with $10 million of, of, of projects and, and opportunities, it really will absolutely change the Everglades and, and South Florida. Um, so I think it's, it, sometimes it gets lost of how historic it really is if we can get this dedicated funding source approved. Um, any further board comments or questions, and then we'll turn to public comment. Okay, let's, let's turn to uh, public comment then. Right now we have 50 uh, proposed speakers. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have two minutes of public comment per speaker. Uh, if, if we can hold the applause and, and the, and the um, support, if you can hold up your hands in, in evidence of support, uh, if somebody's saying something that you agree with, the board will take note of it. We did it last time. It seemed to work and be pretty effective. And um, we want everybody, first I thank everybody for taking time out of their schedules to come down and participate in this. I want it to be a very transparent process and discussion. And um, I think it's, it's helpful to have everybody hear all the facts. And I think, Tom, you did a good job of, of uh, going through the PowerPoints and, 